Digital technologies are revolutionising the way we experience the world. Finland is at the forefront of this revolution. So why Finland? We have the technology expertise, the digital ecosystems and the creative spirit to be a real technology superpower. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the Arti uh, Artificial Intelligence from Finland live stream, Shaping the Future. Thank you so much for finding the time to join us uh, in your packed schedules. My colleagues Tsujan, Kati and myself will do our utmost to make sure we have an interesting program for you today. We are joined by six different companies and organizations and almost 30 of you, you journalists from Europe and Asia from a dozen different countries. My name is Hetta Huittinen and I head up international media and PR for Business Finland. So as many of you know, we normally invite journalists to join us on the ground here in Finland to discover our companies. But due to the pandemic, this is now the second time that we are organizing a hybrid event from a studio here in Helsinki, where we've invited uh, some of the companies to join us here, and some of us, uh, some are joining us uh, online as well. We are keeping sh safe distances in the studio. We are wearing masks when we're not on camera, and also we've been using hand sanitizer, so you can be assured that we're keeping it safe here. Um, I'll mention right now that we do not have an expert joining us on Finnish COVID-19 policy. So if you have any questions about that, please send those to us by email and we will re respond to those offline. You should be able to see the agenda at the bottom of your screen now and you've received it uh, already in advance by email. Please note as well that this live stream is being recorded, so those of your colleagues who couldn't join us uh, online today will be able to watch it afterwards. And we'll also be sharing the link to the live stream with you, so you can watch it again if you so wish. And at the beginning of each segment of our program today, we'll be uh, educating you about Finland, so we'll be showing uh, quick five facts from Finland videos. And also at the beginning of each segment, we'll show an introductory video about the company or organization in question. And we've also got one pre-recorded client case that we'll be showing you. Uh, after we've watched the introductory video, I will ask a representative of the company or organization to join me here. And I'll ask a couple of questions to start, off, uh, start us off. And then after that, you'll be able to ask your questions. I'll be picking them up from the chat and asking them from our experts. And in order to keep it nice and lively and interactive, we have two polls. You will see the polls uh, in the platform that you're using today. And I'll be then sharing the responses to those polls um, later on. I'd also like to remind you that there is a 20 to 30 second delay in uh, the time that we see your comments or questions online. So please bear with us there. But now to get us started um, and to give you an overview on how a small country like Finland can be one of the global leaders in AI, let's watch a short introductory video and then I will ask uh, my colleague Oudi Keski, you're the head of the AI business program at Business Finland, to join me for an introduction. But first, let's watch the video. Digital technologies are revolutionizing the way we experience the world. Finland is at the forefront of this revolution. Our secret is a unique government-supported ecosystem where companies, research facilities and universities form a tight-knit community. Finland has recently been ranked number one in the world in university industry collaboration. Our large amount of open data and supportive legislation create a strong foundation for new digital services and AI technologies, leading us to the era of platform economy. The development of augmented and virtual reality innovations is supported by highly developed electronics and camera technologies. The gaming industry provides us with programming skills and platforms to create even more imaginative technologies. 
One of these innovations is Varyu's headset that uses a bionic display technology that mimics the characteristics of the human eye. It lets you see things in the virtual world just as clearly as you see them in the real world. The VR and AR technologies in the future will revolutionize the way that people use technology. So instead of using a computer merely through a monitor, you can actually step inside the experience and it's all around you. The Finnish critical communications are among the fastest and most reliable in the world. Our authorities form a strong network together with an innovative cluster of businesses and are quick to adopt the latest technologies. F-Secure is one of the leading experts in cybersecurity, both in Finland and internationally. We are the first generation in mankind's history who are living our lives here in the real world, but also in the online world. And that's what makes cybersecurity such an important topic. So why Finland? We have the technology expertise, the digital ecosystems and the creative spirit to be a real technology superpower. We believe in world-changing ideas and turning them into global success stories. Finland works for us. Now let it work for you. Business Finland. World Ideas. So, welcome and good morning, Oti. How are you doing this morning? I'm fine. How are you doing here? I'm all right. Okay, so I have a couple of questions for you to get us started, and then uh, we'll start picking up questions from uh, our journalists as well. So first of all, um, Finland aims to be a leading country in applying artificial intelligence in business and society. How can we actually achieve this goal? Um, I think that we can make it happen together, so we get all significant players like the industry, researchers and public sector and the enabling organizations like Business Finland to go to the same direction. And, and then of course, additionally, we need to, all citizens to adapt to that AI as well. And, and by providing the education and increasing the awareness, they are, they, there will be more trust and, and, and uh, citizens are more prepared for the future and, and those changes that AI will bring. And we actually have Tem Roos, who is behind the Elements of AI course, talking to us a little bit, just a little bit mm. later, so he can expand a little bit more on that. Um, what is the uh, potential of Finnish AI competencies internationally? Uh, we have been um, researching uh, uh, artificial intelligence actively since 1960s and, and uh, this has uh, created a very strong competence base in, in Finland. And uh, kind of like uh, according to LinkedIn data, uh, they claim that Finland has the second largest AI expert number in the Europe. That, that's that's quite impressive for a population of uh, five and a half million. And you touched upon uh, research, but how are Finnish companies benefiting from this research or making use of it? Uh, so we have a lot of this uh, kind of like uh, collaboration with um, universities and industry and public sector, uh, and, and we are kind of like accelerating this with, uh, this with uh, government funding for innovation. And, and in addition, the Helsinki region is actually regarded as one of the most uh, powerful uh, startup ecosystems uh, in AI in the Europe. That, that's right. We have a, we have a very robust um, uh, startup uh, startup scene here in Helsinki, and we'll actually be talking to a startup, but from Oulu a little bit later today. Um, the video uh, mentioned that we are entering the era of the platform economy. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit and maybe give us uh, some examples of B two B platforms? Yeah, I, I think that all of us know the, the kind of like platform economy that is very uh, consumer centric, like the uh, Airbnb and, and Uber and, and, and that kind of thing. But now we are to, moving towards the kind of like uh, business to business platforms and, and uh, government uh, to citizen and government to business platforms. And, and there are not dominant players in these areas yet. Uh, so Finland is very actively using the AI and, and data and, and building the a child, uh, a child way, uh, these new platforms. Um, where do you see that AI holds the greatest promise in the future for Finland or even the world? 
Um, uh, we will see that uh, actually the effect on all areas and, uh, and, and it's going to make um, all services more automated and, and more uh, autonomous. Uh, but uh, in addition, um, it, or actually it doesn't kind of like replace the human, so mm -hmm. it will be augmented human and, and replace us more in, in the pouring and, and more the uh, boring task routines and, and those kind of the tasks that require uh, mass of the masses of the kind of like uh, uh, data cap capabilities or, or the data processing capabilities. And uh, we will kind of like uh, concentrate those things that require creativity exactly. and empathy and, and, and uh, also ethically. Uh, uh, kind of like uh, ethical thinking. Absolutely, yeah. And we, we'll actually be talking to a company, Digital Workforce, which is uh, doing uh, very much in this uh, in this area of decrease uh, of giving the sort of uh, mundane jobs uh, and mundane uh, 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 jobs and, and and things to to um, uh, AI rather than having people people focus on that. Um, Finland is said to be the number one in university industry collaboration in the world, uh, but how does this show up in practice? So it, it, it show up in, in the way that uh, we have a lot of the uh, common projects, so we co-create. Uh, so there is a research and 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 the uh, research and development done in the. Uh, companies in, in the simultaneously. So we kind of like uh, research and apply the results of the research uh, simu simultaneously to the uh, products and services of the companies. All right. Um, you, uh, you touched upon uh, the, uh, the part that uh, government plays, uh, plays in this uh, area. Um, you, Open data and supportive legislation uh, can be seen as being very important. Uh, could you explain why it's so important that uh, legislation supports the development of AI? So the current, um, so if we start from the beginning, so the current AI is very much uh, he or heavily based on the uh, data, and, and, and therefore the, uh, it, it's very important to get the public data uh, into the use, and, and therefore, uh, actually, uh, uh, government has the very central role uh, in the opening up that data, and also the creating the rules how to utilize this data, and and and, uh, and also to involve all stakeholders uh, to that, and and of course, then uh, as well, kind of like. Uh, uh, provide funding for the innovation and, and increasing the awareness and, and, and providing some education. Absolutely. And it looks like we have a question now from, uh, 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 from The Economist, from Ariane Sa uh, Sanz. Uh, she's asking, uh, we're seeing personal service uh, being reduced during the pandemic and replaced with automated service. What risks are there with AI that customer service will become worse instead of better? Um, of course, the, if the, the AI that is used is not very um, developed yet, it, it might, uh, <coughs> might kind of like have this kind of risk. But uh, the currently uh, already uh, the, actually the um, uh, voice recognition and all these kind of uh, technologies are so well uh, developed that, that it's possible to kind of like uh, build a, a very, very good services for the customer development. And, and then of course, the kind of like have this kind of like ethical way that uh, how we uh, avoid, uh, for example, bias uh, in, in services and, and, and so on. Absolutely. Those are very good points, uh, Aldi. And uh, please do stick around uh, until the end. And uh, a note to our journalists that all our experts will be around for the wrap up towards the end. So if you come up with more questions uh, as the program uh, uh, goes further, further along, please save those for the end. And, and we can, uh, will invite Aldi and the other experts to join us again to, uh, towards the end. But now, thank you, uh, Aldi, for your time. Um, 
And now to give you a little bit uh, more inspiration after a chat with Odi uh, on the part that AI is in, uh, increasingly playing in our lives, let's watch the first of our Finland education videos, the five facts from Finland, AI in daily life. So with those five facts uh, now in mind, it's t the time for our first poll. The question is, uh, what's your experience with AI in daily life? And we have multiple choices for you. Uh, A, online chatbots. B, VR smart glasses uh, for gaming or other purposes. VR uh, virtual traveling experiences, for example, virtual Helsinki. Uh, D, others or E, none. And you should be able to see the poll questions on your screen. Um, and I will be sharing uh, the results of the poll after our next uh, theme. The elements of AI course has become hugely popular and is aiming actually very quickly to educate 1% of all European citizens by the end of next year. We'll first have a short look at an intro video on the elements of AI, and then a professor of computer science and le uh, leader of the AI education program, Temu Roos, uh, will tell us more, more about, the, um, about the course. And once again, I would like to remind you that you can type your questions into the chat. But now, let's watch the video. We built a free online course that will give anyone, anywhere, the tools needed to understand AI what it is and what it can and cannot do. AI is power, and in Finland, we believe it belongs to everyone. Tämä tekoäly niin se ei ole mikään tulevaisuuden hirviö, vaan se on ihan arkipäiväinen asia. Ja se on ihan hauska asia. Kyllä mä suosittelisin tätä kurssia kaikille, jotka haluaa niin kuin pysyä ajan tasalla, ettei edes katso, että mitä se on. The Elements of AI combines Finland's national strengths an exceptional education system and leading technological capabilities. Thousands of Finns have taken the course, cutting across gender, age and socio-economic lines. At the end of its presidency of the Council of the EU in 2019, Finland decided to invest in people's future skills. With the help of the European Commission, Finland will make the Elements of AI online course freely available in all official EU languages. We want to equip EU citizens with digital skills for the future. Our ambitious goal is to educate 1% of European citizens in the basics of AI by 2021. AI will be one of the cornerstones of the success and competitiveness of the EU in the future. Elements of AI is a movement and we want you to join us. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Uh, so a couple of questions for you. Um, could you please tell us about the idea and motivation behind the Elements of AI course? What kind of course is it actually? Well, first of all, I, I should emphasize that it's, it's, it is a course, but it's mm. actually a bit more than that. It's, it's actually um, you know, an initiative or a movement, if you will. And, and the, the goal is really to reach uh, people that would not normally be the, the users um, of online courses. So, so people who wouldn't normally seek information about digitalization or AI online. And that's, uh, so, so the course is, is, is of course, it's, as, as you said, it's a course. It's there online for free for anyone to find. Uh, but what we, what we really try, try to do is reach out to people, sort of do that like, uh, you know, grassroots level uh, activities to invite people to to find this and interact with it and and each other, sort of welcoming people to the let's say AI community. Absolutely. Um, ha ha you having said that about uh, the AI uh, community, um, 
AI is very present in our everyday lives and in society. How are you motiv motivating people to join this community and take part, uh, take part in the course? Well, that's actually what, what you said uh, is exactly the, the, the motivation that it's really present in, in our everyday life. So it's, you know, if you, if you use your mobile phone, your, your, your uh, smartphones, uh, if you're searching for something online, if you're on social media, you're getting recommendations about content or, uh, you know, music, films, even, even news items, uh, that is being filtered by AI. And I think it's really relevant uh, to every one of us. Not because, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that everybody should start sort of coming up with their own version of a search engine. There's, there's a big company that does pretty, pretty well. Um, uh, or, or building their own systems necessarily, but it's, it's really more like uh, being able to understand how it affects the, the way the society works, how those like filtering algorithms that, that kind of control what, what information we get to consume and interact with, uh, how does that play together with, the, with, well, with us, with humans, with the users. And, and understanding those things is much easier if you know some things about the basic principles. Exactly, yeah. Hence the elements of AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. There's more. Um, you have a very uh, ambitious goal of educating one percent of uh, Europeans in uh, in the uh, basics or elements of AI. Um, which countries and languages is the course available in, and how many users are there actually in Europe at the moment? Are there maybe some countries that have been more interested in this or than others? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, the interest and, and uh, the reception that we've gotten has, has been amazing. I mean, there, there were more than 10,000 people signed up on the course even before it existed. Like, we, had this, we, had, we just had this page where people could sign up on the course when it is launched, and we had more than 10,000 people there. Uh, and then, you know, since then it's like 20, 30, 50,000, 100,000, 200,000, and it's now it's something, something like 556,000 or 560,000. Um, people all around the world. I don't think I have a breakdown in terms of, uh, of Europe versus the rest of the world, uh, but there's, uh, there's certainly, certainly uh, a lot of countries where the interest has been um, amazing. Um, I, I think um, I, everywhere where we've launched, you know, you asked about which countries uh, uh, it is available in its Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian, uh, Baltic countries, uh, Germany, France. Um, we just launched uh, Croatia uh, yesterday. Fantastic. Um, the the most uh, most enthusiastic uh, learners uh, I think might have been just from the top of my head maybe Germany Norway um, Poland uh, they they had have lots and lots of people Ireland too so there's a, there's a lot of interest uh, in it, basically everywhere and in every cat, you know every segment so it's not um, it's not like only young people mm. that, you know we put good people. The oldest users have been 80 years of, of age or older, and there's you know fairly even share of men and women. Even in the Nordic countries, it's more female users than male. So it's really interesting, interesting that there's yeah. a lot of interest everywhere. That's, re that's really interesting. Um, where, do, where are you going from here? You've got uh, you said about 560,000 people signed up. Are you reaching your goal for 2021, or how, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're working hard on You're that. You're working on um, it. It's a, it's a big goal if you if you if you sort of calculate what is one percent of the European mm. uh, population. It's a lot of people, uh, but still, I I think it, as a goal, it is sort of perfectly uh, reachable. And I think, you know, of course, we're not going to stop there. In, mm. in Finland, we're way past 1% already. And of course, we're not stopping. I think it's really something that everybody should learn um, one way or the other. Uh, it, not necessarily maybe through this course, but maybe other, other, other ways. Maybe there should be something in the schools. Mm. Uh, so we're yeah. really, really sort of continuing this and, and sort of being, bringing it into people's awareness. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, what are the future prospects now for the elements of AI? You're continuing to promote it. Is there something else coming up? Or yes, definitely, we're continuing mm. on the on the basic course, but we already launched a follow up course. So there's a, right. there's a course uh, course second second course now in the elements of AI uh, series, and the second course is called building AI, and that is sort of training people uh, to to actually start working or at least sort of getting ideas about new new AI solutions. So we're kind of uh, uh, enabling people to t become active contributors in the AI community. Uh, and, and there's going to be, um, actually on a Friday this week, there's going to be a course 
um, by, launched by the University of Helsinki on the ethics of AI, which is also another sort of really interesting and, and, and sort of urgent topic that we should, should, should address more. There's some of that, some of that discussion in the elements of AI in the mm, first course yep. uh, already, but there's a sort of there's a sort of longer story sort of starting to starting to be uh, opened up in the ethics of AI course that's coming up as well very soon. Yeah, that, that we're uh, actually uh, I'll be mentioning that and we'll be sharing a link uh, link to that uh, event on the on on this Friday uh, towards the end of uh, our bread broadcast today. Is there any uh, feedback that you can share, maybe incidental feedback that you've had from people who've taken the course? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the sort of things that I enjoy the most is that the course is quite interactive in certain mm. ways. There's, there's um, uh, the, the, some of the answers of the students are open-ended, so yeah. they can, you know, they can write about how AI is affecting their own life and how they sort of see it before or after the course. And, and we get to sort of interact with them. We kind of, um, uh, there's some sort of peer uh, evaluation going on there. And we, 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 we take part in that process to some extent. So we get to sort of live the experience or sort of learn about AI together with the students. And then there's a platform where we have um, um, this sort of forum for interaction and sort of, again, sort of building that community and, and sort of helping people find each other. And there's been a lot of interaction. I've, I've met a lot of people, sort of met, like online met yeah. people who have changed maybe some of their sort of ambitions and sort of said, okay, well, this is something that I want to pursue more, mm. maybe, maybe take some career changes even. Um, so there, there's a lot of stories and I, that's, that's of course what keeps us going with you know, the people, people that we can sort of reach and, and, and make something meaningful, meaningful for, them, for them. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Demo, so much for joining us and please stick around. Uh, we didn't have any questions for you now, but uh, with our journalists watching the program, I'm sure that we'll have questions uh, further down the line. So please uh, join us a little bit later sure. as well. Um, so I promised you now that I would have uh, the first result, uh, the results of our first poll after I chatted with uh, Demo, and we have those now. So it looks like the most uh, experience uh, you have with uh, AI is in the form of online chat bots. So 50% of you have been uh, in contact with chat bots, and then the, uh, and 18% of you have tried uh, virtual travel experiences. So that's that's very interesting as well. And smart glasses, VR gaming, that comes comes in third. All right, those were the results of our first poll. Um, and now, before we move on to the next part of our program, uh, where we'll be talking about the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare, let's have a look at your second installment of your Finland education: Five Facts from Finland: Healthy Lifestyles. We'll next be talking about the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare, and we'll be meeting uh, two companies in the section, Iphoria and Serenian. Uh, Iphoria will be talking about supercharging pathologists with deep learning AI, and then Serenian will present AI tools for the analysis of brain functions. But first, uh, let's watch a short video about Iphoria's image analysis.
So now I would like to uh, invite Kaisa Helminen, who is the CE uh, COO of Iphoria, to join me. And she will be joining me online from, I believe, Northern Helsinki this morning. How are you, Kaisa? How are you doing? I'm, I'm fine. fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, Good to, to be, be here. here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have a couple of questions for you uh, about, uh, about your company and how you are using AI. Uh, so first of all, uh, what motivated you to start developing AI solutions for anatomical pathology? And for those of us who are not doctors, that means the analysis of tissue biopsies. And what are the sort of key benefits that you can offer in this area? Sure. sure. Let me start by explaining the need first. So anatomical pathologists are really in a key role in a wide range of medical diagnoses, for example, in diagnosing cancer. And they are the ones who see from a tissue biopsy how severe the cancer is. Is it stable or very aggressive or perhaps sending metastasis? And based on the pathologist report, of course, supported by other lab tests, Clinicians then decide the treatment for the patient. Is it chemotherapy, radiation, or perhaps immunotherapy? And yet, despite of this very, very important role, in many places today, pathologists still rely on, you know, hundreds of years old manual microscopy or other visual methods, which is slow and subjective, of course. And when you combine this to the fact that the cancer samples and incidences are constantly increasing, and, and many countries and areas suffer from serious lack of pathologists, the experts. It's clear that something needs to be done to improve the, both of the efficiency, but also the accuracy and consistency of the diagnosis. And we've developed Iphoria really to address these needs. And our mission is to ensure that every patient receives diagnosis as soon as possible, no matter where they're located, and to make sure that it is the right diagnosis so that then it leads to the treatment uh, that best works for their, this patient. And, and what we've done and what we do is that we bring AI to augment the experts in the sample review. So our software is able to identify and grade, for example, tumors from samples, count infected cells, or measure like how far immune cells are from tumor borders. This is a really hot topic in research today in immuno-oncology. So we're not really replacing pathologists at all, but we're augmenting them so that they can tolerate this constantly increasing sample volume uh, increase and, and be more efficient with, their, uh, with the, all these routine applications and, and reviews and use their valuable time and expertise in more difficult or rare cases or consult for their peers, etc. So in summary, we are really transforming pathology analysis, enabling faster, more accurate, more personalized treatment also for the patients. And, and if I may add a couple of words about the technology part as well. So we have this kind of a unique approach in this medical images and AI field as we've developed a cloud-based AI platform, which is highly versatile, where both the AI training part and the analysis part is extremely fast and smooth, and data is easily accessible from any location with a browser and internet connection. It, it's really built for medical experts, for them to easily participate in training the models, uh, adapting them for their local needs, etc. So all they need is their image data and domain expertise, no coding or data scientist needed. All right. That seems like it's a it's a very specific technology, but definitely helping helping in a very very uh, important area. Um, is there maybe a client case uh, you could present to give us more context on how how your technology works in practice? Yes, of course. So majority of our customers today are in the preclinical research. Uh, for example, researchers studying cancer or neurodegenerative diseases or, for example, pharmaceutical companies who are looking for new drug candidates or te testing the toxicity and safety of those. At the moment, we're also actually expanding to the clinical diagnostics market uh, as a company as well. But I'll give you an example from the research settings. Um, it's a cancer research project that has been, um, and, the, and this application has been developed together with uh, Dr. Peter Westcott at Tyler Jack's lab at MIT in US. 
and they're studying a non-small cell lung cancer, which actually accounts for about 85% of all new lung cancer diagnoses. And in their experiments, they generate a huge number of uh, tissue samples from mouse models, which demand careful and very labor-intensive quantification evaluation to, to really uh, define the tumor grades and burdens of each sample. And with manual methods, it's, it's of course, again, slow, inaccurate, and highly inconsistent because different people have different uh, internal standards and opinions on how the samples should be graded. So we started a collaboration with them, and, and together we trained AI model to really automatize this tumor grading and, and burden calculation for them. And it, it really means that we trained convolutional neural networks to learn certain patterns of these different tumor types. And as a result, they've been really able to standardize and normalize these important metrics across their lab and, and also between different labs and significantly speed up the sample review, but also it's giving them completely novel type of quantitative information from these samples as they can identify tumor heterogeneity within, within the individual tumors and, and this way really enable totally new kinds of research approaches to understand the disease is better and make new discoveries. But as said, uh, we are moving from the uh, preclinical, or not moving, but expanding from the preclinical research to the clinical diagnostics as well. And there we will be offering a really wide range of uh, solutions to cover the most histopathological analysis performed in diagnostic labs, starting from the most common cancers like uh, breast, prostate and lung cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. So that was a really uh, uh, interesting uh, example. And now we actually have a question from one of uh, our journalists, Nicolas Goss from the Contrôle Essai Mesure from France. Uh, he asks, uh, industry often gets inspired by medical to improve its inspection skills or for raw materials. Do you also work with, for industry and production uh, inspection for better quality, for instance? Yeah, that's an excellent question because I didn't yet come to that. So, so we've uh, developed this platform majority and, and primarily for medical domain uh, for these enormous images of histopathological samples. But we have also sold this platform for various other types of uh, applications also outside medical field, especially in the uh, quality control applications of various industries. Yes, it is fully compatible. Fantastic. Um, one a question to ask uh, during these uh, very strange times. Um, does Euphoria have a connection uh, with the fight against COVID-19? Well, histology or tissue biopsies do not play a role in, in the diagnostics. Instead, it's done with molecular methods. But uh, but uh, Euphoria can be used, of course, in the research applications related to COVID-19, where researchers are trying to understand the disease mechanisms better or develop new types of detection methods, which might include also imaging. But of course, uh, again, in drug and vaccine development, certainly uh, very useful. But also have to say that indirectly, indirectly uh, the global pandemic has, of course, truly catalyzed the urgency of going digital in the, uh, in the medical field, also in the pathology labs. And we've seen uh, uh, it actually uh, accelerating the development there because it's, of course, much easier to, to send a, a digital image for a review for a pathologist who's in a remote location rather than sending the glass slide over the uh, postal mail. So... Or, or with the courier, so it's it's certainly uh, a true benefit. And we've also seen regulatory authorities uh, sort of easing their restrictions and allowing allowing pathologists also to work remotely uh, and review samples uh, there, just to you know reduce the uh, exposure to the virus for them. But also one one important area we've seen uh, benefits of uh, of this uh, platform is uh, in the educational purposes because. Uh, Medical education is one of the areas where they still need to cope with the uh, lockdowns, etc. And uh, and also prior to the pandemic, Euphoria has been used in medical universities around the globe for remote teaching uh, classes. So 
that has definitely been an area where we've seen uh, seen uh, the need for various types of digital tools. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Kaiser, for your responses at this point. Um, please uh, stay close to your computer so that we can uh, we can hook up with you uh, towards the end of uh, uh, end of our se session for any other possible questions that uh, that we might be getting from from our participating journalists. But thank you, Kaiser, for for now. And um, uh, next, we'll move on to our, our second health AI company uh, called Serenian. It is uh, a very exciting startup from the city of Oulu, which is the technology capital of northern Finland. But before we, uh, we speak to uh, Jukka Kortelainen, the CEO and co-founder of Serenian, who's also joining us online, uh, let's watch a short video about their technology. In an intensive care unit, the function of the lungs and the heart are constantly monitored. But what about the brain, the most vital organ? The brain is not continuously monitored. This is because EEG recordings are difficult to interpret and require a trained EEG specialist. To solve this problem, Serenian has developed c -Trend software, which translates the standard EEG measurement into one simple score that reflects the status of the brain. For the first time, ICU staff can now follow brain function at the bedside. C-Trend also helps EEG specialists in laborious interpretation of long EEG recordings. Innovative C-Trend technology enables fast and accurate clinical decision-making, improves patient outcome, and saves lives with less resources and lower costs. Serenian, the next generation brain monitoring company. All right, I should now have Jukka Kortelainen online. Jukka, are you there? I'm here. Fantastic. Good to, here. <laughs> Good to hear your voice. Uh, you're up north in uh, Oulu. Do you have any snow on the ground yet? There's some snow outside, but uh, we're waiting more to come before Christmas. Okay, absolutely. We definitely need more <laughs> snow by Christmas, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, a couple of questions to start us off. Um, how was the uh, innovation that, that was presented on the video born? And what have you been some of your biggest uh, challenges so far? Yeah, so the innovation presented in the video, uh, which eventually led to this uh technology, it was born already a few years uh, before Serena was even founded. So uh, back that time, I was working in, uh, as a medical doctor uh, at the hospital and, and spent a lot of time with intensive care patients. And I was actually surprised how little we were capable of following the brain function of these patients. Uh, so as I said in the video, uh, we follow the heart, we follow the lungs, but uh, we rarely follow the brain there. And that's kind of surprising. So, uh, so we started to innovate a technology for this um, based on our, our previous uh, experience, EEG, patented the technology and, and then found it ceremony on to commercialize the technology. So um, you ask also about the biggest challenges. So uh, I would have to say that the biggest challenge, at least so far, has been related to the uh, clinical validation of the technology and the kind of the regulatory issues related to it. So, so we're dealing with a medical device uh, and we have to show the benefit and the safety of the product before we can really commercialize it and bring it to the market. So, uh, so fortunately, we had scientific evidence of, of the technology already before the company was even founded, uh, which made things a lot faster for us. Uh, the clinicians, uh, the medical doctors uh, who will be using our product also provided us very early uh, with uh, user experience so that we did not have to change uh, the product much during the development process. So, so because of this, uh, we are now actually in a very fascinating situation. We're just about to launch the, the C-Trend uh, product in a few days and start sales in Europe. So are you, where are you certified now with your device? We will be certified uh, with a CE mark, which allows us to uh, start sales in Europe. Perfect. Uh, within actually a few days. So That's very, very exciting. Times. Very exciting for you. Um, yeah. 
as you mentioned, uh, you you are a startup. You've uh, you've been around for about two years now, and you're actually a spin-off company from the University of Oul. Uh, what kind of support uh, have you received from the uh, sort of larger Finnish health ecosystem? Yeah, well, we have had a lot of support, I have to say. So, so of course, for startups, funding is uh, naturally one of the biggest challenges and issues, and uh, and and we are fortunate to have great instruments for that here in Finland. So first of all, the thing that, that startups really need is a, is a venture capitalist or investment money. So there are quite many venture capitalist companies here in Finland willing to fund great ideas already at the early stage, which means uh, seed stage. Uh, this is absolutely necessary, of course, for startups because the development of medical device, for example, it's, it's uh, very long and ex expensive process and it has to happen of course before you can start selling on the product so investment is needed uh, but secondly and and maybe even more more importantly we had an exceptional opportunity also to to start planning of, of the commercialization of our technology already when we were still working at the university so this was made possible because of business Finland's uh, so-called research to business project so, uh, so with this project, we could kind of measure the, the research innovation uh, to a business idea without risk already before founding of the company. So overall, the public funding instruments, uh, such as those provided by Business Finland, are extremely important uh, for startups and kind of supplement uh, the private investments. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for the Business Finland pitch there as well. Thank you. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. what, what has been the uh, response of doctors and nurses to your technology, and is there, uh, is there an application to the pandemic that we're in right now? Uh, yeah, well, the, the response has been very positive. Of course, we are just entering the market, so we are getting, uh, getting the, the first feedback from the from the uh, from the ready product only now but uh, but at the trialing of the technology we have been uh, working uh, kind of constantly with the so-called end users or the medical doctors who will be using our product all the way and we have designed our product to be as easy to use as possible and and many of the doctors and nurses have been kind of surprised how convenient it is actually now to follow the brain function uh, of their patients with our technology and of course, including this kind of a entirely new method into into daily practice it requires also also learning from the users. But but the overall response has been has been very positive. And and you mentioned COVID nineteen there, so so uh, sequent can also be used remotely, which which makes it kind of suitable for patients with infections such as COVID nineteen. So so the person who who uses the technology and evaluates the brain function of the patient, uh, he or she doesn't have to be in the same room with the patient. And, and because of this, we can reduce the risk for exposure uh, of the staff to the, to the disease uh, and, and spreading of the infection in that way. Yeah, that, that's an important, important aspect for sure. Um, you mentioned already that you're now uh, certified with, uh, for, for, for Europe with the CE uh, certification. Um, what are your other international plans? Is it based on certification or uh, is there other, uh, something else going on as well? Yeah, so the regulatory issues, of course, play a big mm, role yeah. there. So, so I said uh, we're just about to launch the, the C-Trend. Uh, as an official medical device and I start sales in, in, in Europe. But, uh, and this uh, actually happens together with our partner companies whose, uh, whose EEG devices will be including our, our uh, Citroen software. And the Europe, uh, European market is rather big. Uh, however, we are planning, of course, to expand also to, to other countries. Uh, United States, of course, it's very interesting for, for, I guess, all of the medical devices and maybe other countries also. Uh, that will happen in a few years, uh, probably also also to some countries in Asia uh, within a few years. But as I said, the regulatory issues, uh, they have to be, of course, considered when, when going to these new market areas and getting, for example, the FDA clearance uh, plays a big role in the, in the schedule for getting to the international markets. Absolutely. Um... Your technology uses uh, AI, as, as we've discussed. Um, 
how, uh, how do you see uh, the use of AI uh, in healthcare in the future, or is there, uh, is there something else that you're developing, the, the AI you're using in your cu current product to develop maybe other uses for it, other, other products? Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a difficult question uh, to say kind of a kind of an overall healthcare is such mm. a big field overall. Yeah. But but my opinion is that that using AI in healthcare overall will be inevitable in future, of course. And and somebody said it really well that uh, that AI will not replace doctors but the doctors who use AI will replace those who don't so mm. so uh, yeah. so uh, as, as mentioned already in this broadcast AI uh, I don't think that the role of AI will be replacing doctors in that sense but more like providing a tool for the doctors so I I, I definitely agree with that I, I mean there's an increasing amount of data uh, available to the doctors, uh, and it's it's purely impossible to use all that information in clinical work uh, without help. So that's where we need AI and and uh, kind of to to integrate all this information and produce it in a simple form that is easy to use by the doctors in their in their clinical practice. So. That's exactly also why our C trend technology was developed, kind of to to help doctors who are not experienced in interpreting the EEG, the recording of the electrical activity of the brain, which is a complex recording, uh, and to still use it in their clinical work. Absolutely. All right. Um, I think that is the uh, time we have uh, for the moment. Uh, uh, once again, uh, I'd like to thank you, Yuka, for joining us uh, online, and uh, I'd ask you uh, as well to stay close to your computer. We'll we'll chat with you again towards the end of the session uh, if we've had um, more questions at that point. So now, thank you, Yuka, and I'll speak to you later. Thank you. All right. So uh, to do a little bit, a uh, little bit of a recap. Uh, so far, we've uh, spoken with uh, Olti about uh, from the AI Business Program uh, at Business Finland about uh, the AI scene uh, in Finland, if you can call it such. Um, then we've talked to Demo about the elements of our AI and how citizens are getting educated about AI. And then we talked to uh, Kaisa from Iforia and Jukka from Serenian about the applications of AI in in healthcare. Um, and now to set the stage for the last part of our session uh, this morning, which will be about the use of artificial intelligence in organizational transformation, let's have our second poll. And our second poll question is, uh, in your opinion, which aspects will be influenced by AI the most in the future? We have multiple choices again. So will it be healthcare? employment and working culture, education, manufacturing and production processes, or E, something else. And uh, once again, I'll share the results of the poll with you once, I've, uh, once we've talked about um, AI in organizational transformation. And now, the third installment of your uh, Finland education. Here is five facts from Finland, Finland in figures. All right. Um, so now uh, the last segment of our program is about the role that artificial intelligence is playing in organizational transformation. And we'll be talking to two companies, uh, Futurists and Digital F Workforce. Uh, Futurists will be talking about uh, how to create organizational connectivity and a connected company with the help of AI. And Digital Workforce, uh, on the, uh, for its part, automates and maintains business processes, freeing up time uh, of employees for more purposeful work, a topic we've also touched upon earlier today. So uh, 
uh, shortly I will invite Tuomas Syrjänen, who is the Chief AI Officer of Futurist, to, the stu uh, to join me here in the studio. But uh, first, to get an introduction, let's watch a video about what Futurist does. So your company is growing. That's a good thing. To manage the resulting complexity, you are now producing silos. Your functional silos are failing to communicate with each other, unable to tap into organizational knowledge and coordinate work across boundaries, creating a dire disconnect between your core functionalities and processes. The result is a slowed down operation and inefficiencies stemming from issues like poor product market fit, duplication, waste and suboptimization. There are ways for you to connect people to knowledge, activity to impact, alignment across hierarchies and build flow efficiency across your whole organization to make your core processes more responsive and more resilient. What's best? You don't have to fill out any new forms or deal with complex new systems. Because the disconnect can be repaired using data that you already generate, the existing digital footprint. We ensure that your core business processes can work in harmony without compromising your privacy to give you a connected company that is ready to thrive in today's complex world and ensure future success. Core business processes working in harmony, building future success, not just reporting on the past, radically more responsive and resilient. This is the connected company by Futurist. This is the future of work. All right, thank you for joining me, uh, Tuomas. And once again, I would like to uh, remind our journalists that you can leave any questions that you have for Tuomas in the chat. But a couple of questions to get us started. Um, could you elaborate on why connectivity is so important uh, when talking about AI and what is a connected company? <laughs> yes, so let me start from actually sort of like from the futurist perspective. So. Connected companies are also our own renewal. So we are currently 650 people across Nordics and, and Germany and UK. But when we sort of pa grew past like 300 people, we realized that, that there starts to be bad disconnects. First of all, like knowledge, who knows about what? So hmm. we, we say to our clients that you get the knowledge of several hundreds of people into your use, but how on earth would person in, in Stockholm know what knowledge we have in Stuttgart to, to be able to tap into that? But we also realized that they're like, like the leadership perspective started to differ from the frontline perspective. We started sort of seeing problems, but we only see the problems when they arise. We didn't see it when they were born and, and so on. So we started actually rethinking that, can we actually uh, rethink how the work should happen? But then we also realized that actually we have data. We have the digital footprint that we leave behind ourselves, whether it's ERP, whether it's CRM, whether it's Slack messages, whether it's Office. And we realized that we can actually use that data to actually fix those disconnects. So we can tap into the organizational knowledge, we can identify which knowledge we have, we can channel that to the right place, we can connect the kind of the, the perspective of leaders with frontline and so on. But then we also realized that, that when we're working with our clients, that they actually experienced exactly the similar issues. Automotive R&D, how the sort of functional silos are working very efficiently internally, but incompatible between the silos, or in construction, so how the visibility is zero or, or the flow is not very good and or healthcare or, or energy. So that's the kind of our journey. So, so it's both our own renewal, but it's also like sort of working with our clients to, to bridge the organizational disconnects that come from managing the complexity of a big organization. Um, and actually uh, another point uh, is that um, data and I, uh, AI adoption, uh, with, uh, even with all these disconnects already existing, the adop uh, adoption of da uh, data and AI has been quite slow in uh, traditional organizations. Why is that? I think there are several reasons. So I think that the number, number one reason, the first reason is that there's actually quite a big disconnect between technical people and business people. Yeah. So in order to make things happen, you need a, need, you need a solid business agenda. So th that has been quite often missing. So how do we do that? Then, of course, the one, one challenge is the data, how to get the data out of the existing systems, and especially how to make the data available across functional silos or different parts of the organization. And, and then, of course, then humans are one, one sort of like topic. So what we realized is that although the business agenda is important and technology is difficult and data is sometimes takes time, but the main challenge is behavioral change. 
how do we get people to actually change their work habits so that, that we get the, the impact? And I think the, those are the reasons. So it's a, it's a quite long journey, but we see that it's, it's actually a journey worth taking. And in a minute, we're actually going to watch a video of one of your clients, Vira, which is a Finnish construction company, and how they've been, uh, how they've been able to manage these disconnects. But first, we have a question from one of our journalists. It's once again, it's Nicolas Goss from Contrôle et Mesures from France. Um, uh, is it easy to be in competition with uh, GAFA taking data into high consideration? You probably understand that question better than I do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I, I think that the, the key point is that <clears throat> that we are using sort of like the, the data that we are using is, is company internal data. So, yeah. so yeah. In, inside, of course, we also build bridges between the companies and the markets, but then we are using sort of external data sources and, and, and actually part of those, those companies are actually also sort of like uh, providing tools how we can do it. But I think the internal data, sort of the internal digital footprint is the mm. kind of source and the raw material for, for our connected company. And, and, and there, I think that it's, it's it's more kind of our kind of approach than, than the, the GAFA approach mentioned there. Okay, cool. Let's watch the video now uh, of your client, uh, Fira, which is, uh, as I mentioned, is a Finnish construction company and how they're uh, using uh, or how they're becoming connected company. Fira is a construction company, uh, Finnish based, and uh, which loves problems there are a lot of in construction business and we are solving them using new technology. We are building up a global production system for construction and the idea in this production system is so that it is scalable and we can cut off production time by 50% from the current situation. Fotorize is our business partner and we are continuously working together and we need this connected company thinking and those methods so that we can improve and we can utilize this digital footprint, assessing our production and outcome and impact and so on. Yeah, so far we have been able to cut this production time by 20-30% and also we've been able to increase our profitability uh, by 4%. Fira and Futurize, we together we are making a global phenomenon. We are enabling others, also other construction companies, to renew their business very in a very efficient way. So, uh, having watched that video, how does the FIRA, FIRA partnership uh, then showcase the, uh, your connected company? Yes, so... So first of all, the, the, the FIRA sort of like overall mission of cutting down the production time, improve quality has several elements, like there's modularity, there's standardized sort of design elements, and, but there's also a very big role to the digital footprint. How do we increase the digital footprint of construction? Because it's, it's, it used to be quite non-existent, but mm -hmm. now there's much, much better digital footprint. But then, of course, the other question is, how do we take advantage of that digital footprint? How do we create situation awareness? Because that's one of the key challenges that construction has had, that there hasn't been any sort of consolidated situation awareness, what is really happening. There's been even, even sort of cases where I know that there's been like several months of disconnect, not with FIRA, but, but with other companies, disconnect between the top level program plan and what really happens on the ground. So several months of like leadership thinking that, that progress is different than, than really what is happening. Now that when we get the digital footprint, then we can actually start using that great situation awareness, but we can also sort of like start visualizing the flow. So the, one of the key disconnects that we see is that, that typically knowledge work and other kind of like human-based work is not connected to the flow efficiency. Like in a, in a different way, manufacturing has moved the flow efficiency already mm. decades ago, yeah. but not the other parts of the organization. But now we can use data to visualize the flow and we can address the processes. But there's also other disconnects. So for example, one thing that, that the FIRA uh, approach helps to do is that move part of the work from the site, actually the construction sites, to the office using the data. So then we can build shared service centers, which actually can support the work on the site, but also makes it more productive and, and, and faster to do centrally. So there's lots of different aspects of, of the, the FIRA transformation, the global production system, and how connected company relates to that. 
Excellent. And we have uh, a question now from uh, Kai Strittmatter from Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany, uh, mm -hmm. and asking, uh, in Germany especially, there generally seems to be a high degree of skepticism towards mm -hmm. all things AI and big data because of an underlying fear of uh, privacy and data security issues. Is that not an issue at all in Finland because of the high level of trust? Um. I would say that, that, yes, we have high level of trust, but, but the privacy is, is one of the key topics that we are working with. And I think it's, it, starts, it starts also from the intention. So our key intention is to help people to succeed in their work. So not just create tools for the leadership to see better what happens. It's very much about how to help. For example, one of the tools that we have internally is to help people to navigate the organizational knowledge. So we take the digital footprint and turn that into, into insights who knows about what. So we built in, for example, several levels of privacy. We filter certain topics out. Uh, we also sort of make every search visible so that, that people actually are not, not searching what they're not supposed to search. But also the key driver is helping people to learn. So the intention is really important. But also then the transparency, how data is used, for what purpose, like what kind of challenges there are. So, so I think a big part of our program is also to make sure that it's privacy preserving and takes all these uh, topics into account. So very good question. And we have uh, next, uh, a second question uh, from uh, Daniel Killy. Um, question to all, uh, uh, I guess to all Finland, uh, to all of uh, us, and maybe we'll repeat this question uh, later as well. Um, Finland is doing a lot when it comes to digital traffic solutions. Is there a concept for autonomous public transportation involved as well? Is that something that uh, Futurist is involved in? Um, not that much direct. Okay. No, no. Yeah. There, yeah. we've, been, we've been part of, for example, some autonomous like last mile delivery topics and, okay. and so yeah. on. But, but I know there's, there's kind of different systems about the autonomous uh, public transport. Yeah. yeah, I think we'll uh, ask this question again once uh, we get to our wrap up where, yes. where we have Odi, for example, present who, who is aware of the whole scope of yes. AI activities happening in, happening in Finland. Um, maybe one final question. I, I don't think we have any, any from our journalists, so maybe a final question uh, from me. Um, uh, we, uh, what kind of operations uh, does Futurist uh, have internationally? We talked about the uh, case that you've had uh, here in Finland with a, uh, a construction company, but what kind of um, work are you doing internationally with clients? So Yes, we have actually quite large presence in Germany. So we have offices in Berlin, Stuttgart and Munich. And we work, for example, with the automotive companies, energy companies like E.ON mm. um, and so on. We also have a uh, sort of like uh, rather good presence in, in, in Stockholm. Then we have Norway, uh, UK. So actually we, we work with, uh, with a lot of sort of major international players. And our key markets are the, the, the German speaking world and the Nordics. OK. All right. Um, I think at this point I will uh, say thank you uh, to you, uh, to you, um, uh, and uh, and uh, we'll move on to um, our next uh, next company. Um, and Thomas, uh, as mentioned, will be around for the wrap up as well, so we can ask him further questions at that time. But thank you, Thomas, for for now. Um, and next I'll be asking Jukka Virkkunen, who's the partner and co-founder of Digital For Workforce, to join me in the studio. But before that, we'll watch a short video uh, on how Digital Workforce works. You are our second Jukka of today. <laughs> Thank you for joining, joining me. Thank you. Uh, once again, uh, a couple of uh, questions about uh, your company and what you're doing around uh, AI. Um, so uh, what is intelligent automation 
which you work with, and what is the role that it plays in organizations today? Intelligent automation, or today we can call it also as a hyper-automation, is a set of technologies, like uh, artificially intelligent, robotic process automation, but also many other uh, technologies which enable organizations to, to automate processes. And first of all, we are talking about process automation, customers, business, and, and administration uh, processes, how to automate those and, and increase productivity in the organization. Um, and how do you, in fact, then uh, build an AI-powered or organization? And how does your company, Digital Workforce, help with this? So when we talk about AI-led organization or building uh, artificial intelligence in the organization, it's always a, a, a um, initiative which requires top management support and, and sponsorship. And uh, we can see that, uh, that intelligent automation is a part of, of a customer's digitalization strategy yep. or digitalization transformation. And, and in, in most of the cases, we can say that it's, it's a vital part and we are not able to succeed in digitalization without these kind of, of, of tools and, and, and services. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, and our role is, is, is to help organizations to build a, a proper organization to manage and, and uh, manage this kind of, of initiative as well as as uh, recognize the processes which should be and could be automated. We often train also the, the people for, for organizations. And uh, we help organizations also to build up a governance model, how all stakeholders, business units will be involved into this, this journey. Uh, I'm looking at whether we have a question now for Jukka, and it looks like we do. Uh, the question is, as mundane processes become automated, how do you retain workers uh, who have been uh, doing, the, uh, doing those jobs? How much more education and better competence, uh, competence will workers in the future need, since they will, not, uh, they will have to do more complex work? Will there be people who are shut out of the uh, workforce? And this question is from Ariane Sands from The Economist. So, uh, first of all, we can see that these technologies enable organizations to get rid of uh, uh, knowledge work routines and, and also free people to more valuable tasks. And uh, so, uh, in the video, uh, we already saw that, that we have delivered over 4,000 processes into production and and returned over 10 million hours back to business. And in very few cases, organizations have reduced the, the number of employees. So actually, there is a, a hidden need of, of people after, after 2008 uh, recession, bank crisis, there's a lack of, of, of development in many organizations. So, so actually, it has been a, a really big uh, benefit for organizations to get already people who know the organization and, and become, uh, I would say, even a internal consultants. Uh, yeah, that, that, that makes complete sense uh, now, now that you explain it that way, that, yeah, that there is uh, uh, this freeing up of sort of more, for in a more innovative thinking. Yeah, and, and actually we see now the exact the same phenomenon of what happened in the production uh, in, in previous decades when we moved from, from manual work to robots. And now we see the same in, in, in office environment, that we move from manual routine works to, to automated processes, and then people become advisors of customers or internal organizations. Perfect. Um, once again, we need to uh, uh, address the issue of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, can you give us, uh, uh, do you have an example of how uh, intelligent automation has been used in the, the current situation that we're in with the pandemic? 
So uh, now when, when we have lockdown in many countries, so, so, so there are still tasks which should be accomplished at the, at the office environment. And, and um, especially robotic process automation, which uh, automates the routine processes is a huge advantage. And we have one airline company uh, which has utilized successfully the technology once they, the Indian uh, search service center was locked down and, uh, and they canceled flights and, and they, they, they have to uh, organize the refund to, to passengers. And, and they estimated in, in last spring that, that the re refund, the, the, uh, the, the airline tickets would take five months. And they asked help from us. And, uh, and we automated the process practically in one week. And, uh, and the refund time decreased to one week. Oh, sorry, to five weeks. From, from five months. months. Yeah, that's a, that's a major, yeah. major decrease uh, and major efficiency accomplished there. Exactly. Um, uh, I think uh, I'm looking at the screen now, and it doesn't look like we have uh, any any further questions from from our journalists. Uh, is there maybe uh, some? Uh, is there something else that you would like to add? To, uh, to share with, with our journalists about the kind of work that you're doing with companies. So, so we have one, one uh, customer example in, in Norway. It's a uh, Norsk Stål, uh, almost 200 years old uh, supplier of, of, uh, of steel and metal. And, uh, and they are operating in a highly competed environment and they had a uh, problem with, a, with the order handling and uh, and today previously they had um, the process took uh, four to five days, and also the problem was was the scrap metal, so the waste, and uh, and uh, so we use these hyper automation technologies in in the cloud environment. We combined robots and 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 AI technologies so that we can say that that. Um, Robots were software robots were like like hands and legs to to gather the information, but also share the information, and and then the AI engine was like a brain to to handle the problem. And uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we used robots to to gather the uh, the re retrieve the the information from mail flow. Open the the um, attachment, which was practically the order, and then we distributed that to 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 AI engine, and AI engine optimized the the uh, the order uh, and uh, and returned that optimized order to customer for the confirmation, and we were able to reduce this process for from five days to one hour and also uh, decrease the, the amount of waste with 10%. Yeah. Yeah, Tangible right. benefits from, from a relatively easy uh, automation. Exactly, exactly. All right, um, at this point, I would like to uh, thank you, Jukka, for, uh, for your you. time and uh, ask you to stick around as well. Uh, we might have uh, uh, some more questions for you uh, towards the end of uh, our session in the wrap up. Um, so th thank you, Jukka. And now, as I promised, uh, I, will, I have the results of our second poll for you. So uh, in your opinion, uh, the uh, AI will most, uh, mostly influence healthcare. 34% uh, of you are of that opinion. And then, uh, and this, I guess, goes to you, Jukka. <laughs> Manufacturing and pro production processes are, are seen as, as benefiting very much from AI as well. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure uh, our, our friend at uh, Futurist will be happy to hear that employment and working culture is up there uh, with 21% uh, in terms of an area that a AI will influence. But uh, thank you, Jukka. And, uh, Next, we will go uh, to our final Finland education video for today, uh, which is uh, five facts from Finland, top rankings.
now uh, nearing the end of our live stream and it has come time to wrap up. Uh, all our experts today are still available for your questions. So please, please, please uh, feel free to send us uh, to us through, through the chat. chat. Um, and before we go to our wrap up and final questions, I'd like to remind you of the Ethics of AI course, which uh, Demo referred to earlier. Uh, so uh, this Friday on the 27th of November, the City of Helsinki and the University of Helsinki will organize a hybrid event uh, about the ethics of AI. The uh, participants to this event will hear about the possibilities and challenges of using artificial intelligence in public service with real life examples from cities such as Helsinki, London and Amsterdam, Amsterdam as well as the Finnish Ministry for Finance. Um, and at that event, as promised, uh, the, uh, the Ethics of AI online course will also be launched. So if you're inter interested in the ethics side of things, um, that is coming up on Friday. And my colleagues Katya and Suishan will add the link to the chat now so that you can register for that event. But now it's time for your final questions uh, and fi some final takeaways from our guests. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Outi and Teemu first, um, and I have uh, a question for, for you uh, now before we go into questions from our journalists. Um, since you're uh, both uh, working more from the sort of public sector side of things and public, uh, public sector view on things, uh, what do you think is the most important a thing informed citizens should know about AI. Demo, do you want to answer to that first? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, th that's a good question, and I think um, um, I would say the first thing is that the the basic principles are not that complicated. It's 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 not necessary to be you know you don't have to be a coder. You don't have to be you know mm. you don't have to have a, a PhD in you know uh, computer science or mathematics or anything. Everybody can understand the basic principles, and 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 then it helps really to understand what are the limitations and what are the like what can go wrong and so on. So uh, I, I should just say that the first thing is to understand that it's it's really understandable by everyone. It's not it's it's not the the boogeyman. It's it's not it's not something scary or intimidating. It's actually quite fun. Excellent. And Audi, do you want to uh, expand on that as well? I think you need the microphone. Oh, I have. Uh, you have, you have oh, you, have, you still have okay. your microphone. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So um, uh, I would also the, uh, add that the data mm. that uh, yeah. to understand that um, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, nowadays is is based on the data, and and therefore uh, kind of like understand that uh, also that. Uh, how to use data for it, and 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 how to create common um, rules, how to use data. So all society needs to be kind of like involved in that, and and that is kind of like important thing where we all are needed, and and that is the I think the kind of like uh, one of the things that create the trust in the society if uh, all kind of like stakeholders are are participating in those or kind of like uh, creating those rules. Absolutely. And we have a couple of questions. There is one from uh, uh, Daniel Kili from uh, Redaktionsnetzwerk from Deutschland. Um, this one's for you, Oh, uh, Finland is doing a lot when it comes to digital traffic solutions. Is there a concept for autonomous public transformation, uh, transportation, sorry, involved as well? Do you have information on that, Oldi? Um, yeah, I, I think that there's a bit and bits and pieces. So we mm. have, like, uh, for example, uh, Sensible Four, uh, the a company that is uh, producing this kind of the small passes, autonomous yeah. small passes, and 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 then we have, uh, for example, uh, Mass International or Mass Global company that is kind of like creating this kind of like system that where you can very flexibly uh, kind of like change the uh, these um, uh, different vehicles and, and so on. Then we have, for example, Unikie, uh, the company that is uh, uh, putting effort on, on these um, softwares for the autonomous driving. Uh, so uh, so there's a um, lot of companies and they are doing their bits and pieces, but not yet the, so that we could be able to kind of like combine all these together. Yeah. So yeah. they are not quite ready, uh, all those pieces are not that mature yet that uh, they could be kind of like combined together and, and automized whole 
entity. Yeah. So but I think that will come. Yeah, so work still to be done a little bit yeah. there. Um, and this question uh, we had uh, before, uh, and uh, uh, it'll, uh, this one is for both of you, Demo, maybe if you answer uh, first. So from Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, Kai Strittmatter, uh, in Germany especially, there uh, generally seems to be a high degree of skepticism towards all things AI and big data because of an underlying fear of privacy and data security issues. Is that not an issue at all in Finland because of the high level of trust, maybe? Yeah, an excellent question, and uh, hello, Kai. Uh, <laughs> good to see you. Um, uh, good question. Uh, the uh, the trust is really uh, something that sets us apart, and something that we sometimes even forget to take into account. That it's a different when we when we you know when we communicate with other uh, you know uh, other people in other countries. Uh, a Finn might sometimes forget that. Uh, trust to the public towards the you know to, towards the the authorities uh, is very different. I was just talking to um, a, a person in the UK uh, about the the question whether they feel positively about just having a, a, a personal identity number and that being a, a a new thing. He had moved to Finland and he had first sort of felt that oh this is really like big, big brother stuff. I have this ID number and for Finn it is like it's. <laughs> It's, we're so used to it so that we don't necessarily think about it. And I, th I think that's a good question in the sense that we need to understand that it's not always the same everywhere. Um, and of course, like I think what Tuomas said before when this question was asked to him, I think, uh, was that we need to work on this. We need to sort of acknowledge the fact that this trust is not granted, so we need to work to maintain it. And and we are doing a lot of work on that, on ethical AI, on, on you know, uh, the My Data movement and, and similar initiatives, uh, protect uh, the citizens' rights uh, in in the data economy. So I think we need to strive to to maintain it, uh, but it is a fact that it's a different thing in Finland and in in other countries, and and that's also something that we need to keep in mind when we export, uh, for instance, our our services. Absolutely, uh, Odi, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I think that uh, there needs to be a kind of like discussion that uh, all all stakeholders are participating, and 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 that that way also creating the uh, more trust in the whole society and and especially uh, I, I think that there still needs to be also the good uh, cyber security because yeah. I think that that you need to also the kind of like secure in in, in technical way all, all data as well uh, and, and and then uh, I, I would also kind of like uh, I would kind of like raise up the uh, all other technological uh, ways how to kind of like protected protect people uh, um, kind of anonymity and, and 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 that way the they they personalized uh, uh, data for example we have this uh, fin data state yeah. owned uh, uh, healthcare data operator that yeah. can provide um, health data for the uh, research and innovation purposes, and there we have uh, make a lot of effort to kind of like uh, uh, to store the uh, privacy of the kind of like all people that are are, are giving their data to that. Absolutely, yeah. All right, I think um, that is all the questions that we have for you, uh, Odi and Demo, today. If we get any more questions, we'll, we'll share those with you offline. So I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. And next, I would like to ask uh, Kaisa and Jukka to join us again, um, uh, join us again online. Um, Kaisa and Jukka, can you hear me? I guess you can. <laughs> Yes, yes, we can. can. Yes, and I can hear you loud and clear as well. Excellent. So uh, I have a question for, for you as well. Um, we had a, a little bit of a discussion this already, but, uh, but uh, maybe you can uh, expand on it. Maybe, Kaisa, if you, you start first. Um, where do you see AI holding the most potential in healthcare? Well, I believe that AI will have a fundamental role in medicine and in several diagnostic tasks going forward. But um, one of the first areas I, I think are going to be related to image-based diagnostics. Uh, and uh, already today, AI can easily assist medical experts in their daily work, you know, improve efficiency, accuracy, etc. But it has also so much more potential to go beyond what's possible with human eye. 
and it, I, I believe we are not too far from the day where AI will be assisting doctors in, you know, prognosis of the patients or treatment planning. And I think that it will become a mandatory tool someday. Um, maybe uh, uh, picking up from the question that we had uh, earlier, uh, what is uh, uh, the role of security and how do you ensure that sort of data security remains intact uh, in, in healthcare when you're uh, specifically uh, treating uh, people, well, you're sp treating people with and, and the, the data that, uh, that you're sort of uh, do, um, dealing with is extremely personal. So maybe Jukka, if you would like to respond to that aspect at this point? Um, yeah, I don't think that artificial intelligence um, basically causes any problem regarding the, the data. It's, it's where you process it mm. and how you kind of, uh, how, how do you kind of apply it. So, for example, if you do uh, AI-based uh, diagnosis or providing additional information inside the, the hospital system, it doesn't cause any additional uh, data security problem. But, of course, uh, many of the applications of the AI are nowadays already and will be more in future done outside the hospital. So the data mm. uh, is sent outside to the hospital and processed there and maybe provided back. So in that case, of course, we have to be very careful of uh, how, how we handle the data and it has to be secure connection and maybe reducing the kind of personal information that really identifies the patient to its minimum so that we don't pose any additional risk there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jukka. And uh, now we actually have some uh, questions from our journalists. And the first one is for uh, Kaisa. So uh, Rudolf Hermann from Neue Zürcher Zeitung from Switzerland would like to know, um, could you expand a bit on the topic of how the attitude of the medical community has evolved vis-a-vis -vis AI? Is there enthusiasm? Is there skepticism? Yeah, sure. That's an excellent question. And I think uh, when you think about medical experts, they are certainly scientists and, and typically besides curious towards new methods and technologies, they're also sort of a suspicious by nature as well. So it's, it's clear that every new product or technology that you bring to the market needs to be backed by scientific proof. It needs to go through thorough validation and, and you need to justify that the technology works. But I think if I look at our application, I think that uh, visualization brings a lot of the explainability there to the process so that uh, we're always presenting the results on top of the original image so that the experts can really visually verify the results. Though They, they don't need to trust just numbers or, or black boxes, but, but to really see and understand where the results are coming from. But in general, I have to say that, you know, five years ago, it would have been a bit too early to bring AI to, to especially to the pathology field, where the whole digitalization was just uh, in its early phases. But to date, uh, we see a lot of uh, pathologists extremely excited about this uh, technology, where they can actually start getting the benefits out from the big investments that they've put into the digitalization processes and workflows. So it's it's really the AI that's that's bringing the, the most out of it. So situation is pretty good today. Excellent. Thank so you. So maybe Kaisa. maybe I can add yeah, something to that also. Yeah. yeah. So yeah I think also it's about the attitude and, and how it has changed uh, very lately. When you're dealing with a medical device, I mentioned the regulatory issues already. So um, so it's kind of taken that when you have a commercial product that is a medical device, it has to have benefit that overcomes the, the risk. So in that sense, you have to prove before you can start selling it as a medical device, you have to prove that it really is effective in some sense and, and does not cause any additional risk that would be bigger than the benefit. So, so in that sense, uh, the regulatory system kind of takes care that uh, that uh, you don't get uh, to the market with a device that is not not good for the patient. And so. absolutely. Uh, and now we have a question uh, for uh, actually for you, uh, Jukka. Uh, it's from Ar Ariane Sands from the Economist again. Uh, if doctors are getting more and more information, how do you teach them to manage it? What risks are there that they will have information overload and not be able to handle all the data? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess that is, the, that is the current situation. And that's also one of the issues that we try to, try to kind of aim with the artificial intelligence based uh, technology. So, 
so there is a lot of, for example, imaging data, or in our case, like a, like a recordings from the intensive care unit uh, that causes this kind of a kind of a overflow of, of data for the doctors, and and that's why we need actually the artificial intelligence to kind of produce and integrate this information and produce it in that kind of a form that is easy to use by the doctors in their clinical practice and, and intensive care is a good example for this. So we have, we have laboratory exams. We have, uh, of course, like a clinical evaluation of the patient. We have imaging data uh, and neurophysiological recordings. So all this information, it's, uh, it's causing a lot of troubles nowadays already. And, and uh, the devices, there will be coming more and more and more and more information is provided and the patient is recorded and, and measured. So we need AI for, to exactly for this purpose. And we have a second question for you, uh, Jukka, from uh, Anthony Cus uh, Cuthbertson from The Independent in the UK. Uh, Serenian's brain monitoring technology uh, can be... Uh, uh, can it be used uh, beyond intensive care units in hospitals? For example, could it have applications within more general healthcare settings? And finally, what do you make of the um, emerging trend startups working to connect the human brain directly to AI and computers through neural interfaces such as Neuralink? Okay, very good questions. Um, yeah, our technology is uh, first we have developed it in keeping in mind the intensive care and direct it for intensive care patients because it's a kind of a kind of a uh, problematic situation where the patient is unconscious and it's very difficult to evaluate the neurological function of the patients and that is the the kind of the problem that we started with um, and 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 we, with sequent we can really provide information uh, from the patient that is unconscious because of the anesthesia or sedation in the intensive care or because of the sickness itself. So, so, uh, so in that sense, uh, we have directed our technology for intensive care patients, but it doesn't exclude uh, the possibility to apply it also outside, uh, outside the intensive care. Uh, and actually, there are many applications and kind of a patient groups already that you can apply to. So, so stroke patients, for example, they are very big burden to the healthcare and they are considered to be in an in a emergency uh, or very high risk for, for very, very severe damage in the brain. So uh, these patients are actually uh, very much in the kind of a, in, in the possibilities of, of applying our technology to in future. And, and uh, but again, I'm, I'm going back to the regulatory issues in which you have to show the, the benefit of the technology also. Uh, to the patients. So, so before stepping into new areas, we want to we want to secure our technology to be beneficial in this uh, intensive care environment, and then expand in future to other areas as well. But there are many areas. Um, and then about the second question, which was uh, direct linking of uh, yeah. of uh, brain function to computers. So, yeah, this is uh, of course it has something that has been done in some sense for a long time already. So there's some some applications in which you can control uh, with your EEG uh, online some something or some machine or, or something like that. But yeah, it's a uh, uh, it's something that is of course coming coming also. Maybe uh, it's a bit difficult for me to comment outside the medical field. I'm I'm so much into into this uh, into this uh, kind of a hospital environment. But in in that sense, it could be like an application in which. A uh, person could be like a like a control some some uh, rehabilitation kind of a kind of a system or something like that. And uh, I think this kind of a neurofeedback is is in some sense already as a part of the rehabilitation after stroke, for example, in in some centers. So that's an emerging area also in in this in this field. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Jukka. And now a very, very quick response uh, from both of you to our final question from uh, Rudolf Hermann from the uh, Neue Zürcher Zeitung in Switzerland. Does the use of AI in uh, medicine or medical applications pose special challenges regarding patient data security? We might have actually touched upon that a little bit already. Yeah. But uh, if you want to add something, maybe Kaiser go first. Well, of course, in our field in healthcare, the, all the security matters are super important, and and we of course take those very seriously and and follow the international standards and guidelines for that. So, so definitely an important topic to consider in all medical 
and healthcare related applications. Absolutely. Jukka, is there anything else you want to add to that? No, no. I mean, it's just about the, the how, how you process the data and where you process it and taking care of those standards and, and security in that sense. The AI itself, it, it's not, a, it's not a posing any additional threat, but where you do it, that's, that's the question. Exactly. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Kais and Jukka, for joining us online uh, today. And uh, next, uh, I've actually got uh, uh, my two gentlemen, Tuomas and Jukka, uh, uh, joining me again uh, in the studio. So, um, uh, Tuomas from Futurist and uh, Jukka from Digital F Workforce. Um, one final question from uh, me, uh, and then let's see if we get some from the journalists as well. Um, what should every company consider when thinking about how AI affects the way that they do business? Do you want to start first, maybe, Thomas? Yes, so uh, I think the, the sort of the, first of all, the point of view should be quite holistic. So the way we see is that, that, that data and AI will in influence how, for example, our, how to support existing processes, support existing products, existing offering, and also the way the current business is run. But I think the big opportunities we see in when we can actually start redefining, for example, processes, redefining our offering, redefining how we make money with data and AI. And I think that's the kind of the, the journey that, that, that I see is, is really important. We start with from the existing business and supporting that, but then let's keep our eyes open to the, how we can actually redefine our business. How about uh, you, you, Jukka? So actually, I think that the uh, redefining the business is a good topic. and. Mm. And, uh, and uh, we see that, first of all, we have to recognize the real business case because the technology itself is not an essential. However, it, it, how to utilize it and where to utilize it. And, and, and redefining the business would mean quite different things for, for, for various industries, but, but, but really new markets, new services, new customers. And, and uh, that opens a, 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 a complete new kind of, of setup for the companies for future uh, competition. Yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else uh, uh, either of you would like to still say to, to our audience online? Is there something you would like to add? Maybe I continue from the redefining. Because yeah. Yeah. I think that, that, that the way to look at it is also think about what has been the constraints traditionally, sort of the constraints had been, for example, physical premises or physical kind mm -hmm. of like the, the storefronts or humans' ability to manage complexity, how we set up organizations. We, we set them in a way because we can't, ha as humans, manage complexity that much. So, so now that, that we, we actually have a new backbone for the thinking, which is the digital and the data, and then how do we actually then redefine it, for example, in different industries, for example, whether it's a knowledge work industry or whether it's some other kind of service-based industry or, or construction or so on. So I think that's, that's where it, it comes. And, and I think then the, the kind of the, the related that what we learned is that, that the existing digital footprint, because quite often we think about how do we get the data? How do we en enter new data? We realized that, that we don't want to ask people to fill in any additional data because they are not even filling what they're supposed to fill right now. So let's just use the existing digital footprint but then we get the really interesting topics. For example, one thing that we've been working with St. Gallen University and the local university here in mm. Helsinki is how do we use the digital footprint to understand how our strategy is progressing? Because leaders, again, create a strategy. Yeah. Then organizations start to implement it. But nobody knows what's really going on. So mm. we can actually use the digital footprint to bring transparency into these kind of topics. So, so I think goes to your original question to think about it. I think there exists a huge amount of knowledge and insight already in the existing mm. data. The question is just how to refine it into usable format and how to think about the behavioral change that we want to achieve with humans. Yeah, absolutely. Is there something? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, so actually, uh, one, one clear element is, and, 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 and very often we start the AI journey with uh, various kind of ana analyses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when we talk about refining uh, the business, we, we very often also think about the external business, like I said, in, in the first phase. However, at the same time, it gives us a huge opportunity to redefine or reinvent our internal processes and how we work as an organization. Exactly. I think those are really good uh, words to end on. Um, 
Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, I'm uh, sure that you have provided incredible insight to, to our uh, journalists online. And any further questions we might get uh, offline from our journalists, we'll be sure to share with you. Um, and I think that is actually uh, time, uh, that it's actually now time for us to uh, start, start wrapping up. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, ask my two colleagues to join me. So, uh, Katia and Tsuishan, please join me. These are the two, uh, two ladies without whom this would have not happened. Uh, Tsuishan and Katia, ha between them, have organized dozens and dozens of, of physical media tours to Finland. Uh, and this was now their second virtual one. Um, and I think they're getting very proficient at, the, at this as well. So at this point, I at least will offer up a huge uh, round of applause for Katia and Tsuishan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, so thank you, ladies. Um, and on the screen now, you should be seeing the contact information um, of the companies and organizations that we have presented today. And that information and any further information is also available on the Dropbox. And we've provided a link to that Dropbox to you. Um, any uh, follow-up questions that you might have, please send those to the three of us or one of the three of us. And we'll, be, uh, we'll send those um, onwards to, to our experts. And as always, we're incredibly appreciative of your feedback. As I mentioned, this is the second one we've done. So, so we, we're, uh, we definitely want to develop the concept further and, and uh, need, your, need your help with that. So um, there should be a link in the chat once again to the feedback form. And we'd very much appreciate if you could take the time to fill that in. We'll also be sending that link to you by email so you can't get away from our feedback form. <laughs> we'll, we'll make sure of that. Um, but now, thank you to all our guests uh, here in the studio, to uh, our guests online, and especially to you journalists for the take, uh, taking the time to join us uh, this morning and this afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Um, I wish you uh, all the best for today and uh, for the rest of this year. And here's hoping that 2021 lets us see you physically here in Finland again. Thanks so much and take care. <laughs>